Hi everyone, this is Ezekiel O'Callaghan with Raptor Chatter, here to talk about what happened in November for paleontology, and there were a lot of papers that came out, so without any further ado, let's get started. So to start, we're going to look at an animal that I already did a very brief video on as an addendum to one of my first What the Hell Is This videos, and that's Kailingia Zhangai. Kailingia is a very interesting, very early or basal arthropod. And by very early, we mean it is the most basal, it is the most primitive, essentially, or earliest diverging from the main arthropod line that we have found. Like Opabinia, it also had five eyes, and like animals like Anomalocaris, it had two large grasping appendages at the front of its head, which it would have used to help capture prey. This odd combination of different features helps us suggest new things and a better understanding of exactly what the phylogeny that led to arthropods may have looked like. First, for Opabinia, it does suggest where it likely landed on the family tree of life. It was probably very close to the other guild lobopodans, which lobopodans isn't a very well-defined term, but this does mean that the guild lobopodans were closer evolutionarily to animals like Anomalocaris and the arthropods than they were to more basal and earlier diverging lobopodans, animals like Hallucigenia. So Opabinia is on that line to the true arthropods. Kailingia then suggests for the Anomalocarids that they were just outside of the true arthropods. They were a sister group, so to say. They weren't quite true arthropods, but they were very close, starting to show some of the very same adaptations that make arthropods arthropods, such as having jointed segments throughout the body. However, in Anomalocarids, these were mostly limited to the two large front appendages. Kailingia also suggests the origin of mouth parts in chelicerates. All chelicerates, which include arachnids, but also animals like the horseshoe crab, have complex mouth parts called chelicerate. What Kailingia then suggests is that the so-called great appendages of animals like Anomalocaris and Kailingia would have eventually developed into these chelicerate, which then would have been used by the chelicerates to become one of the most successful animal groups on the planet. Kailingia and animals like it were able to become so successful because of the rapid radiation after the Cambrian explosion, but that's not the only radiation event that's happened. There was another one at the end Permian-Triassic extinction, and afterwards some of the most iconic animals that we know of would come to dominate the planet for millions of years afterwards, and that's the radiation of the dinosaurs and animals that were closely related to them, such as the pterosaurs. There's more diversity than just the dinosaurs and the pterosaurs though, especially in the Triassic. There's a whole clade called dinosaur morphs, which includes the dinosaurs, but also animals that aren't quite dinosaurs yet, like potentially the Cylosaurs, they're still a little bit unknown, and animals like the Lacheropterids. Many fossils of this clade have come from the petrified forest of northern Arizona. However, most of these fossils are fairly partial and can't be very specifically defined as to what exactly it is, only that they belong somewhere in the clade. For example, there is some Coelophysis material coming from petrified forest, but it's really unclear whether or not it's the same species that's been found at the Ghost Ranch Quarry in New Mexico. That's the same time frame. So it's very unfortunate that these are so partial, but they do help us to understand more of the diversity that was occurring at the time. A new study was undertaken using these fossils and the global set of dinosaur morph fossils from everywhere across the planet. What this was able to do is help to establish a timeline for the spread of dinosaurs and their relatives across the Triassic of Pangaea. What the study found is that for Western North America, there was a slightly different pattern of population by dinosaurs in these environments. Whereas Ornithischians and sauropods and theropods had all radiated into most parts of Pangaea by this time period, in Western North America we pretty much only find theropods, and there could be a few different reasons for this. For example, it could just be a preservational bias. Maybe the sauropods and the Ornithischians just simply weren't there to get buried. It could also just be a case of misunderstanding. The Silosaurs have been found from the Western United States, and they may actually represent some of the oldest Ornithischian dinosaurs. However, that's going to need a little bit more research, as there's only been one paper that's really suggested this so far, which came out earlier this year. And finally, it may just be poor sampling. Some of the formations that contain some of the earliest Triassic sediments in the western US haven't been sampled and studied in as great of detail as the areas around Petrified Forest. For example, the Moenkopi Formation and the Dockham Group have both been very poorly researched. And so there could be more fossils hiding out, especially in the older parts of these different geologic formations and groups, that could help us understand better what exactly was happening in the Triassic of Western North America. Diversity in the Triassic, though, wasn't just limited to the dinosauromorphs. There was also the larger clade that they belonged to, the archosauromorphs. 
New fossils of archosaur morphs coming from New Mexico help to show that they were also spreading pretty rapidly during the Triassic. For example, fossils from Lamy Quarry help to show that there was a diversity that was already present in North America, more diversity than even previously thought. For example, there's Tanistrophids and Ashendosaurids, which are two groups that are mostly known from other parts of Pangaea at this time, with Tanistrophids mostly coming from Europe and Ashendosaurids being best represented by Shingrosaurus coming from India. While these fossils are also partial and can't really tell us a lot about what specifically was going on with these animals, knowing that these clades were far more widespread than previously thought can help us understand the different interactions and different complexities that may have existed in Pangaea during this time and during this very rapid radiation after the Permian extinction. It also highlights the need to go back to older collections and potentially find fragments of bone that used to be unidentified and being able to compare them to more modern finds, such as Shingrosaurus, which was only fully described a few years ago, and because of that we actually have a better understanding of what Ashentosaurids are, and so hopefully can use more of these kinds of very partial fossils to understand just how widespread they may have been. And for our final paper on the Triassic, we're looking at a new genus of dinosaur, Erythrovenator jacquinensis. This fossil actually helps to highlight two different things that happen in the sciences, and one of them frustrates me, and one of them is actually very interesting and can help us understand more about the environments that these animals came from. Erythrovenator is known from a very, very small portion of the upper femur, meaning that, as one person on Twitter put it, it essentially looked like this based on what we know of it, with the part shown in white being how much we actually have. Now, this femur does show features that aren't seen on other dinosaurs from the same time period but it's really hard to say whether or not it is its own genus, in my opinion, as it may just be a different kind of variation within a single species, or even if we do find more material from the same animal and it is its own genus, unless it has that same portion of the femur preserved, how are we going to know it's actually the same animal? It's one of those things that I have major concerns with and some reservations with when this is happening in the sciences like paleontology. The other parts of this paper, though, do help us to understand more about what was happening in different environments in the Triassic and what was happening with dinosaur evolution. For example, this is the first known dinosaur coming from this particular assemblage zone in South America. What that means is most of the fossils in here aren't dinosaurs, but instead cynodonts, kind of proto-mammals. They're not quite mammals, but they're definitely on their way to that point. And while this is a small part of a femur, and I don't necessarily support naming an entire animal after it, it just helped to show part of the anterior tuberosity, essentially a rough patch of bone on the front of the bone. This is used in theropods for muscle attachment, and it helps to show that this kind of tuberosity evolved after the theropods and sauropods split, rather than it being ancestral to both groups and then just the sauropods losing it. So this does help us understand how the different radiations of dinosaurs were occurring at different points, and how this may have influenced their evolution with the theropods becoming much more carnivorous as they continued onwards, and the sauropods gradually becoming more herbivorous, with animals like Pladiosaurus still occasionally eating meat, but not as often as later animals, such as the main sauropods, like Brachiosaurus. As for how certain dinosaurs got so big, there was a study on the growth of theropod dinosaurs, which used different bone samples from 11 different species in order to try and understand different growth rates and how the animals would have become so large particularly in the Carcodontosaurids and the Tyrannosaurs. What the researchers found is a few different things. First, Tyrannosaurs took the normal growth period and kept it the same, but increased the rate of growth during that very short period, meaning they would have grown very, very rapidly. Carcodontosaurs, though, essentially took that same growth period and rather than increasing the rate, lengthened it, meaning that they would have still had very slow growth, or at least comparably slow growth when compared to Tyrannosaurus, over a much longer period in order to still reach comparable sizes, with animals like Mapusaurus and Giganotosaurus being essentially the same size as Tyrannosaurus rex, even though they may not have been quite as wide as Tyrannosaurus rex. Finally, the researchers also sampled different bones on specimens, and this kind of helps us to understand how these different bones might be able to influence data. As an example, Sue the T-Rex had a femur, a tibia, and a rib all sampled using boring to try and understand what the different lines of arrested growth, or essentially slower growth periods, would have been. From this, they were able to find that ribs and tibias are actually really bad at finding these because they undergo remodeling as the animal grows in order to support more weight. 
So to summarize, for understanding dinosaur growth, there are different bones that do a better job of helping us understand and actually see the data. And additionally, there wasn't exactly a one-size-fits-all strategy to growth and achieving massive sizes in the theropod dinosaurs. Instead, there were multiple ways of achieving huge sizes, and these kinds of differences may have caused some of the differences in extinction and success that we see in North America, where previously animals like the Carcharodontosaurus were more successful, up until the Tyrannosaurus were able to migrate into the continent. As for the Tannistrophids, we have another paper that looks at how exactly they may have been living. And some of the figures from this should look a little bit familiar if you've been watching the channel for a while because some of these figures were used by the same authors in order to look at a different part of Tanistrophius' anatomy. However, for this paper, they tried to understand how it would have fed, specifically looking at the species Tanistrophius hydroides. By using sophisticated models of the skull of Tanistrophius hydroides, the researcher was able to understand better how it probably fed, with a method called ram feeding, or at least a kind of variation of ram feeding. In the modern day, ram feeding is used by many different animals, essentially swimming towards the prey with the mouth wide open in order to grab it. And Tannistrophius probably did something kind of like this, with its long neck helping keep the body away from the animals so it would be more hidden and more able to sneak up on prey. However, it was also able to find that it probably did some lateral motion with the head, swinging it from side to side in order to make sure it could actually grab onto the prey. So it wasn't just as straightforward as charging straight at it, but charging straight at it and then giving it a quick turn in order to grab the fish or squid or whatever it happened to be hunting. This helps to show the kind of different hunting strategies that were already being present in the middle Triassic oceans only a few millions of years after the end Permian extinction. However, it is also important to note that we aren't necessarily getting a perfect picture of Tanistrophius yet. There still needs to be more research done on the postcranial, the not head part of the body, so we can understand better what exactly it was actually doing in the oceans. But that's really enough for this month on the large theropods. Instead, we're going to look at a small one, and one that might even be a bird. Falcatacli forsterae is a new species of bird hailing from the latest Cretaceous of Madagascar. The study describing the bird found it to be an eantothornine, which is essentially the sister group to modern birds. So there's crown birds here, modern birds here, and then this other group on the side. The eantothornines are interesting because many of them still had teeth including Falcatecoli, although it only had teeth at the very, very tip of its snout. This doesn't mean it didn't have a beak, though. Finely preserved grooves along the jaw do show that it would have likely had a keratinous sheath around the jaw, or essentially a beak. This beak, though, was still rather unlike that of modern birds. In modern birds, most of the beak is attached to the forwardmost bone of the jaw, the premaxillary bone. In Falcatecoli, though, the premaxillary bone is very small, comprising only the very tip where the teeth are of the jaw, with a hugely expanded maxillary bone, where most of the beak attaches, which is something that's completely different from most or all other birds we see. This has caused some question into what exactly is its identity, and if it is actually a bird. There have been suggestions that it could be an oviraptorin, a noosaur, or even the skull of the already described Rehonavis, which is a known dromaeosaur coming from the same formation, but is missing a skull. And the sizes do more or less line up, so this could potentially be the skull of an animal that we already have body fossils for, just not the right ones that line up with one another. Personally, right now, I do somewhat support the noosaur hypothesis, simply because noosaurs are known from the formation as well. And because it does have this highly reduced teeth, something we don't see in most raptors or dromaeosaurs, it does suggest that it could be more likely a noosaur than a very small Rehonavis. However, before we actually get a very good answer on that, we're going to need more fossils. And fortunately, Madagascar is some place that there's a lot of research still happening. So hopefully we'll be able to get some more of those fossils so that we can understand what exactly is going on with this animal. As for other places with ongoing research, Bolivia is the fastest growing country in South America, which means they have resources to start dedicating towards more research, including one of the most expansive sets of tracks known in the world. This trackway coming from southern Bolivia is estimated to have over 14,000 tracks, and many of these have been documented, over 12,000 of them in this paper. However, the ones that were missing were probably already fairly eroded or just accidentally stepped over because there's a lot of fossils there to try and document. The trackway includes animals like ankylosaurs, hadrosaurs, and sauropods, and some of these are fairly poorly represented, most notably the ankylosaurs and the hadrosaurs in the South American fossil record. 
So having these fossils it does help us to understand what exactly their range was in South America, and that they weren't necessarily just limited to the few formations where we actually find their skeletons. However, these make up a very small minority of the tracks, with 75% of the tracks actually coming from theropods, and a wide variety of theropods as well. There's some very large theropod tracks, some medium-sized and small-sized theropod tracks, and at least some tracks that can be definitely attributed to some kind of dromaeosaur or raptor dinosaur. And that's because they only have two toes walking on the ground, with the other toe lifted up in the iconic sickle claw of the dromaeosaurs. These dromaeosaur prints, though, are far larger than most of the other ones that we found, measuring about 8 inches across, or around 20 centimeters. This is absolutely massive when you consider the size of most dromaeosaurs, even relatively large ones like Deinonychus. They would not have a foot this large. Instead, this is something more along the size lines of animals like Utah Raptor, or, from South America, Austroraptor, which was a similar size to Utah Raptor, though slightly different in its behavior. What this means is that these raptors were actually relatively widespread in South America before the end Cretaceous extinction, with Austroraptor only coming from one formation at the very, very end Cretaceous. These tracks from slightly earlier in the Cretaceous do show that they were doing quite well. One of these trackways measures 620 meters, so a little over a quarter of a mile. This is the longest known trackway of dinosaurs anywhere in the world, at least that's known currently. The fact though that there are 75% of these tracks being theropods does imply that there might be some differences that are happening in the environment that are causing this kind of bias. Normally you wouldn't expect more carnivores than there are herbivores in an environment, because the carnivores need to eat the herbivores. The herbivores can be in much larger numbers because they don't need to rely on another animal for their food source. However, the tracks do also give a hint about what might have been happening here. The theropod tracks generally aren't following the direction of the herbivore tracks, which is to say the herbivore tracks are headed in one direction, and the theropod tracks are headed in a different direction. I mean that they weren't necessarily directly interacting, rather they were just passing through here. And it may also suggest that the theropods had a much larger home range for each individual animal, so they could make sure they could get enough food and resources in order to become successful whereas the herbivores may have needed to migrate, at least within their own home range, significantly less, as they could just spend longer times grazing in one area. There's even more about this fossil site that I'm not going to be able to get into in this specific video, just because it is such an incredible site, honestly. Um, so be sure to check out down below in the description, where we'll have a link to that paper. And now to completely change directions, the Chinese Doshan Tou Formation is one of the best places for finding pre-Cambrian fossils, fossils from the Ediacaran before the Cambrian explosion. And now it appears there's another fossil site that preserves very similar fossils, but from the other side of the planet, even during the pre-Cambrian, it was on the other side of the planet even. The Port Vield Formation of Greenland has shown many of the same kinds of fossils as the Doshan Tou Formation, and that's generally fairly large cells. Things like eggs, which can be preserved in the fossil record, as long as it's extremely, extremely specific conditions, which both of these places had. Additionally, the Doshan Tou Formation is slightly older than the Port Bield Formation, but only slightly, a few tens of millions of years. During the Precambrian, these would have been on completely opposite sides of the planet, which means that some of these early animals which may have deposited these eggs were already relatively widespread by this point. They weren't limited to just a few little niche areas throughout the planet. Instead, they were wildly successful already, although only still very small and not something that we can readily identify in the fossil record unless we do have these very specific conditions which lend to this kind of preservation. The Doshan Tou and Port Vialt formations are both about 600 million years old, and if you had asked me if there was a Lagerstein that preserved fossils that were even 1 billion years old, I would have told you that there's none such formation. By which I mean there's a formation called the Nunsuch Formation that does contain these kinds of fossils. Coming from the upper peninsula of Michigan, this formation preserves what is probably a huge freshwater lake that existed during the Precambrian one billion years ago. Most of the fossils coming from this formation are acrotarchs, which is a very vague grouping of different microfossils that we don't exactly know where they all belong. So we just kind of lump them all together so that that way we can keep them all together and then hopefully try and figure out where they belong later. Of these, the spheromorphs have been ridiculously well preserved. So well preserved, in fact, that you can actually see some of the preserved cell walls, and those can be measured so we can understand how the cellular evolution took place over one billion years ago. Some of these fossils also appear to preserve internal structures, 
And while we can't necessarily nail down for sure what these internal structures are, the fact that they only appear in some types of these fossils does suggest that different life forms within this lake were already taking on different types of life strategies in order to become more successful. And that just shows how rapidly life was evolving even 1 billion years ago. Even when it wasn't multicellular yet, there were already many strategies happening to try and achieve that slight evolutionary advantage over competitors. Additionally, there's a good chance that there's some algae fossils in here, although that still needs to be defined at least a little bit better. And these also don't show any signs of multicellularity. Meanwhile, though, modern algae shows a lot of kinds of multicellularity, especially in things like red algae. And finally, we're going to talk about something that I love to talk about, even though it's bad that it's happening, and that's climate change. This study specifically took a massive database of different animals and organisms from all across the world to understand how different extinction rates affected different clades. What they found out is that when there's a lot of prolonged global warming, that bad things happen to perfectly good creatures. That is to say, there's a lot of extinction rates that increase when global warming occurs and when climate change occurs. And there's a number of different reasons for this that do need to be studied in more detail and have been studied by other researchers before. But it does suggest that there are some certain things that we should watch out for in our own modern day extinctions. Most notably, what it suggests is that we should be most concerned about the relationships between coral and their symbiotic dinoflagellates, which is another type of organism which produces energy via photosynthesis. These dinoflagellates are able to give some of this energy to the coral, and they get protection from the outside environment by the coral. Global warming can cause the breakup of the symbiotic relationship, with the dinoflagellate fleeing the coral, and then the coral dying because it's not getting that extra energy, the coral reef collapsing, and then a trophic cascade of all the animals supported by that reef also dying. This is called coral bleaching, and it's something that's been seen in the modern day already. So it's not just this one paper suggesting this, Instead, there's a whole host of observations in the present day that do also suggest this, with this paper using the geologic record to help support the idea. Additionally, with such a massive data set, there's likely going to be further study on it, so we can try and understand what other extinctions may happen as we continue to face even more and more severe climate change and global warming, and what effects that might bring. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. Our next video is going to be on Armadillo Sucus for a what the hell is this video. And I have to say for that one, we had a, a draw on our patrons vote because the patrons get to vote on whatever I do for the what the hell is this. And so I went to Twitter to try and have a runoff vote and there was another draw. And so I just decided Armadillo Sucus had the first vote in. So we're going to run with that. With that in mind, it is the holidays everyone. So be sure to be safe, take care, for the love of everything wonderful in the world wear a mask, and don't go extinct.